Will Judge Kavanaugh be confirmed to the Supreme Court? Now that an accuser has come forward with allegations over 30 years old, there is a pause going on. I want to address that and make some parallels with the book of Nehemiah. You're going to want to hear this. I'm Randall Terry. This is Voice of Resistance. Welcome to the program, friend. Christine Blaisley Ford. She has accused Judge Kavanaugh of assaulting her in, I think, 1985. It was over 30 years ago when they were both in high school. And this has now caused what you would expect it to cause, an enormous flurry and fury in the media. I'm going to tell you from the very beginning, I do not believe her because of who she is. By that I mean, number one, she's a Democratic operative. She was at the march where they were putting the hats on that were supposed to mimic female body parts. She has done extensive work for the Democratic Party. She is a Democrat operative. That doesn't mean necessarily that her story is false, but the timing, the fact that Senator Feinstein had this information from the beginning of the hearings and never let it out. The timing of it is, just doesn't pass the smell test. If this was really important, she could have brought it out at the beginning of the hearing. We could have just had it all discussed during the hearings and it wasn't. Why? Because it was an 11th hour move to try and sabotage what was a for sure confirmation. Up until this, Kavanaugh would have won probably with 55 votes. He would have been confirmed with 55 votes. But more important is that as the news of this unfolds, what we know is that the notes of the counselor for the, for the marriage counseling of Miss, Mrs. Ford, that those notes show that originally in counseling, uh, with marriage counseling with her husband, she said that there were four teenage boys that were there. Now she's changed her story to two, and the other person that she says was in the room has said publicly, this story is completely false, not Kavanaugh. And the person that she's saying would corrobor corroborate her story was the hero. He pulled, allegedly pulled Kavanaugh off of her. And he says, this is simply not true. Now, some of the headlines are saying that he is saying that she's nuts. I, I don't know what quotes can be actually attributed. But the, the bottom line is that the one person who she, she says was in the room says this is a false story. Do you understand? Her only witness says this is not true. People who were close to Kavanaugh during that time have sent out a letter saying, look, we know him. This is not the man we knew. And if you look at the Me Too serial predators, such as Harvey Weinstein, and, and any number of people whose names have now come up and who have been fired, people from CBS, people from NBC, one of the consistent themes is that it is repetitive. There is a pattern. It's, they are serial predators, serial abusers. With Judge Kavanaugh, this is a, a one-off, a complete and total one-off. Allegedly from when he was 17 years old. And the people around him at that time have come forward and said, look, this, we knew Kavanaugh. This is not who Kavanaugh was. It's not who he is. Another interesting caveat. Judge Kavanaugh's mom was a circuit judge at the time of this alleged assault. And she ruled against Miss Ford's parents in a foreclosure proceeding. The parents of this lady lost a piece of property. Okay, there was a foreclosure hearing. Judge Kavanaugh's mom ruled against the parents. This teenage girl knew exactly who the judge was at that time, knew exactly who the judge's son was, Brett Kavanaugh. Do you think... Is it just possible that there was some animus there, some long-term hatred 
because of Judge Kavanaugh ruling against her parents? You be the judge of that. Now the discussion is whether or not they will open reopen hearings to put her on the stand, put her under oath. So here we go with Clarence Thomas round two. For those of you who are old enough to remember the Clarence Thomas hearings, I was watching them morning, noon, and night when they were happening. And as it turns out, Arlen Specter of all people, Arlen Specter, who was a Republican senator at the time, was a pro-abortion Republican senator, by the way. He was the one who had a prosecution background and he grilled um, Anita Hill, who was Clarence Thomas' accuser. And as that story unfolded and, and, and played out, it became clear that she was not telling the truth, that she had a political agenda, just like Miss Ford, Mrs. Ford, has a political agenda. And she has a political agenda. That's clear because of her record, her financial records, where she's given money, who she's worked for in political campaigns, things that she's participated in. And now she is trying to take down Kavanaugh with complete, not only unsubstantiated or uncooperated allegations, but with an allegation that the only other alleged eyewitness in the room says this is not true. Where have we seen this before? Well, we've seen it obviously against our president, but when we come back, I want to point out some interesting things about the book of Nehemiah because we're in the middle of rebuilding the wall here, folks. And it's dangerous business because the enemies of justice, the enemies of righteousness will stop at nothing to continue the evil that they believe in and that they have been committing and they'll stop at nothing to to, to, to stop the restoration of righteousness in America. And I'm telling you, it's an uphill battle. I have no idea how this is gonna turn out. I'll be right back. I'm, gonna, I'm talking about the book of Nehemiah. Don't go away. Warrior guitars. Without question, the best guitar I've ever played, heard, or seen is a warrior. The owner of Warrior, Jay Drand, has an incredible testimony of redemption and healing. God gave him the vision to start Warrior Guitars and a passion to make the best guitars in the world. They only make about 120 guitars a year, each one by hand. Maybe one of them could be yours or a once in a lifetime gift for someone you love. The one thing that I can tell you is this is the most finely crafted guitar I have ever held played a lot of guitars, I own a lot of guitars, and although the quality is exceptional on all of them, this is by far the most finely crafted instrument I own or have ever played, and I'm glad I own it. Contact my friends at Warrior Guitar. Tell them Randall Terry sent you. Welcome back, friend. For those of you who love the scriptures, I would encourage you to read the book of Jeremiah tonight, tomorrow. It's a fairly quick read. And I mean, you can do it in one sitting. The, the, the overarching themes of the book that I want to point out and make parallels here because they're worth making. Ultimately, there's no question that Judah was punished by God because of child killing, all right? Because of homosexuality, going on in the temple and around the temple. Solomon's temple had become a brothel for homosexual prostitution. They had idols, pagan idols, set up inside Solomon's temple. And in the valley of the son of Topheth, they were committing horrific crimes of, of offering newborn children as, as sacrifices to a demon god named Molech. God, through his prophet Jeremiah and through other prophets, again and again warned them that he would destroy the temple, he would destroy Jerusalem. He did it through the king of Babylon. He carried out those threats, God did. So after the dysphoria was over, at the 70 years appointed by God, Nehemiah was a cupbearer before Artaxerxes, the king at that time, who was not Babylonian. And the king saw that uh, Nehemiah was sad and said, what's wrong? And the story is interesting. And 
and Artaxerxes gave permission to Nehemiah to return to Jerusalem and to rebuild the wall, all right? To rebuild the wall because Jerusalem had been a great fortified city. It had been a magnificent city under King David, under King Solomon, and there were, were seasons where kings paid tribute to Israel. So Nehemiah goes back and begins rebuilding the wall. Let's just stop right there. The wall of righteousness in America, the wall of justice, the wall of our Judeo-Christian heritage in this country has been broken down and is overrun. I know that there are a lot of um, Christian ministries and preachers, letters you get in the mail, things that you might hear on television or read in, in, or listen to on the radio. For quite a few years, decades really, there have been a lot of well-meaning people making statements like, we're winning, all we need is your help to do this, send money now, you, you know the drill. But the, the simple fact of the matter, the facts on the ground show that we have lost every major battle for righteousness, whatever it is. Ten Commandments in the Alabama Supreme Court, the Bible in the school, public schools, prayer in public schools, pornography, the killing of babies by abortion, homosexual marriage. Just go down the list. We have been overrun. Now, the Bible says, I will build my church. Jesus said to Peter, I'll build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. Prevail, that word means that there's a struggle. There's a battle. We are the church militant, all right? And if you look at the history of Christianity and you look at the history of the church, there are times where there are major setbacks and where evil has prevailed. You only have to go to Constantinople to see what I'm talking about, all right? Go to what used to be called the New Rome, where the biggest church in the world, Hagia Sophia, was. When, Hagia, when, when Constantinople fell to the Muslims, it was a horrific defeat. When Galatia, the area of Galatia in Turkey, Ephesus, go, go just look at the history, and you will see that Islam overran Christianity. You can look at other nations that have been historically Christian, and see that evil is dominating. So this is a time where we are being pushed back, where evil is in fact getting the upper hand momentarily. But Jesus said, I'll build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail. So there is a long-term struggle pushing back and forth. And in the, in the 20 centuries of Christianity, we can see that if you, if you look at a, like an arc or a graph, you can see that we've been prevailing. If it, if it went like this, you'd see the church starting and you would see that it's going like this. It goes up and then there's setbacks, up and setbacks, up. But the general pattern is one of going up. Human sacrifice is gone. Public worship of pagan idols is gone. Most countries' slavery is gone. The things that marked the Roman Empire are gone, all right? But right now, we're in one of those downward dips. Jerusalem was a rubble heap. America right now on the ethical plane regarding politics, public policy, and righteousness. We're a rubble heap, people. We are. We have socialism. Some of our elements are like communism light. We have debauchery being paraded as righteousness and good. We have people on TV like the Emmy Awards last night mocking righteousness. Woe to those who put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. Woe to those who call darkness light. We're living in times that echo what we saw in the prophetic books of the Bible. And it's similar to what happened in Nehemiah's day. So what we're trying to do right now, if I could use this illustration or this comparison, we are trying to rebuild the wall. We've been overrun. We're trying to rebuild the wall. And God sent Nehemiah to Jerusalem to rebuild the wall. And what do you think happened? He had a letter from the king. He had support. He had revenue. And what do you think happened? All of the enemies of God around Jerusalem said, hey, this is awesome. We're so glad to see that you have authority to restore the wall 
and Ezra was rebuilding the temple. We're so glad that you guys are doing this. This is awesome. How can we help you? That's what the enemies of God were saying, right? Wrong. I'll be right back. Don't go away. Have Muslim terrorists hijacked the peaceful religion of Islam? Or is there more to the story? The answer lies in the life of one man, Muhammad, the founder of Islam. Muslim terrorists see themselves inside a 1,400-year-old story, a narrative that focuses on specific events in the life of Muhammad. We are going to look at Muhammad's life using their most sacred literature. We will look at Muhammad at the Battle of Badr. We'll see him deal with those who mock him. We'll see the times when he used deception. We'll witness Muhammad's anti-Semitism. And yes, we will discuss Muhammad and his teachings concerning sex, slavery, and jihad. Friend, if you want to understand Islamic terrorism, get this series today. You can see a pattern with the satanic, with the evildoers, their spiritual counterparts, the human counterparts. It's just, it's, it's a playbook that you can look at the past and predict the future, okay? So what did they do to Nehemiah, the enemies of God, led by Sanballat, the ringleader of evil? Well, they tried to discourage people from building. They um, tried to lure Nehemiah into the temple or the temple area where they were going to assassinate him. And he said, no, I won't do it. They accused him falsely of wanting to build the walls so that he could pronounce himself king. False accusation. They used a false accusation to try and derail him from accomplishing the work of rebuilding the wall. So if you look at the false accusations that I believe this woman is making, it's, it's just, it's right out of the book of Nehemiah, the spiritual and political dynamic. It's a replay. This is their play. And then you look at how President Trump has been attacked unceasingly, sometimes with truth, sometimes with falsehood. Sometimes with Stormy Daniels, sometimes with a, a Russian collusion. But the point of the attacks is the same. And that is to stop the rebuilding of the wall of righteousness and justice in this country. And the, the symmetry, or rather the, the um, allegory here, plays out in reality with the southern wall that needs to be built to protect our borders and the, President Trump's policies of, of limiting immigration from certain Muslim nations where we cannot vet if these Muslims coming here have a commitment to Sharia law and a commitment to overthrow the United States way of life, okay? So it's not just an allegory, it's kind of reality. <clears throat> these evildoers mean business and they are fighting against President Trump, they are fighting against Judge Kavanaugh, and they're using a playbook from as old as the book of Nehemiah or older. And friends, President Trump is not a perfect man. I did not elect him because I wanted him to be my pastor. I did not elect him because I wanted him to marry my sister. I elected him because of his policies. That's it. The presidency is about policy and the ability to execute campaign promises. And what President Trump has been doing is bringing jobs back. He has been picking people for the Supreme Court who are hopefully going to vote to overturn Roe versus Wade. He has been moving forward with his plans to build a wall on the southern border, saying, I'll have our military do it if need be. He has been moving forward with defending American jobs against unfair trade practices in NAFTA, with China, and with Europe. He has been opening the Keystone Pipeline. He is working towards American energy independence. He has been a stalwart defender of the Second Amendment. He has been saying we're not going to let people from these Muslim nations in. In other words, his policies, what he promised he would do during his, his campaign, he is executing, 
He's rebuilding the wall slowly with the help of people like you and I. He's rebuilding the wall. But what's happening? The same thing that happened with Nehemiah. People are, the enemies of God are trying to discourage us. They're saying lies about us because at all costs, they want to keep evil going and they want to keep the walls of justice and the walls of righteousness torn down. So don't be demoralized at times like this. Fight. Call your senator and tell them, confirm Kavanaugh. Call them. It's easy. 202-224-3121. That's the switchboard number. I've had it committed to memory for 25, 30 years. Call the number and say, I want my senator and say, I'm urging my senator to confirm Kavanaugh now. Don't wait till after the election when it might be too late. I'll be right back. We've got a clip to show you from our newly released movie. Don't go away. What Would Mohammed Do? Islamic Terrorism Explained is the best movie series documentary ever produced on the life of Mohammed and Islam. How do I know? Because it's what critics are saying. John Moore, radio host and author said, I learned more from What Would Mohammed Do about Islam and Islamic terrorism than I've learned from everything I ever read and watched in my entire life. Friends, this is what the experts are saying. No one has ever done what we've done. I encourage you to get one, two, four copies. Call 304-289-3700 or order it at the address or the website that you see on the screen. Friend, we have a series that will help you and those you love to have an impact on this country. It's called Insurrecta Nex. That's Latin for revolution against the killing of innocent people. This is the history, the philosophy, and the theology of social revolution in America. We look at the Stamp Act, the Boston Tea Party, the abolition of slavery, the abolition of child labor, women's voting rights, the civil rights movement. All of them have this in common, courage, sacrifice, dedication, and in your face tactics and rhetoric. That's one of the reasons that we've been losing the culture wars the last 40 years is because the bad guys are using these tactics and we aren't. We will send you this 14-part TV series along with these manuals for students, a teacher's facilitator guide for only $40. Go to 304-289-3700. 304-289-3700. Friends, our new documentary, Mohammed in His Own Words, is done. Here are some excerpts. Mohammed, the founder of Islam. Muslims believe that he was the prophet of God, or messenger of Allah, or apostle of Allah. I am God's messenger to you, commanding you to worship God. I summon you to God and warn you of his punishment. Save yourself from hellfire. Most of us in non-Muslim nations know nothing about Muhammad. Nothing about his life, his words, his example, and his companions. I have been given superiority over the other prophets. And while I was sleeping, the keys of the treasures of the world were brought to me and put in my hand. To understand Islam, Islamic law, Islamic governments, and unfortunately, Islamic terrorism, we must study Muhammad's words and the critical events in Muhammad's life, and thus the example he left his followers.
I encourage you, go to randallterryfilms.com and you can rent it digitally or you can order the DVD. I promise you, there's nothing like this in the world. And please pray for us. Thank mm -hmm. you.